guys, welcome to another episode of Mitchell's Logistics Corner, where we bring you real-time information of what's going on in today's logistics market. Okay, guys, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of exciting news. Um, I call this a shit show, but you guys can call it whatever you like. But um, we'll get more into it a little further down in the video. But let's start off with what I typically start off with, and those are the rates coming in from China. Um, what I'm really excited to see is that a lot of these rates are stabilizing and coming down depending on the lane. So some of these steamship lines are finally realizing, hey, listen, we can't keep price gouging. Um, and I have to give a lot of respect and a big shout out, which I should have done weeks ago, to CMA. That's right, I'm giving compliments to a steamship line. Um, congratulations for freezing those rates. Um, it, was, it was great. A few steamship lines followed. Unfortunately, the one that, um, that I was really looking forward to follow was, was good old Merce, but they don't care. Um, it's, it's terrible. So, uh, okay, let's get into those rates. So from Yantin to Savannah, uh, we're looking at about $10,000, and that's with OOCL. Uh, Yantin to Houston is paying about $16,000. Yantin to LA is paying about $9,000, and Yantin to New York is paying about $13,500. Now, keep in mind, guys, these are FEU, so if you're paying around this area, you're doing pretty well. Um, you're getting pretty good rates. There's some people that have more volume, and even though they're saying that they don't have volume rates out there, it's all spot rate. Trust me, people are getting better rates. So, um, but that's just an idea. Again, FEUs. So from Shanghai to LAX is 9,000. From Shanghai to New York is about 14,005. And then from Houston, uh, Shanghai to Houston, it's paying about 15,000. So as I mentioned, guys, you know, these rates are start, finally starting to stabilize and come down. Now, if you think we're going to go back to the 3,200 or 3,000 or 4,000 for a container coming out of China, uh, those days are over. You will not see those days anymore. Um, even with volumes, I, I can't see those days actually happening. Um, and as I kept mentioning to you guys, um, with these rates coming down, it is going to ease a little bit of inflation. But at the end of the day, um, they're not going to come down fast enough. And it's not going to cause that much of an effect because there's other parts that are really causing supply chain for rates to go up, which we'll get to in further down the video. So um, like I told you guys months ago, inflation is real. It's coming. And we as supply chain people are the first to see it. I mean, Congress today was speaking about it. You know, they don't like taking responsibility and how these are elected officials that's supposed to be smart. They didn't see that supply chain was a problem. This was months ago. Um, I'd almost say like nearly a year. Um, and now they have no one else to blame. So let's play. Let's let's blame supply chain. Um, guys, this is it's such a, a funny game. So. Expect to get a lot of attention. Um, there's going to be a lot of attention going into the logistics industry. So I'm excited to see what happens. I'm not excited to see how regulated it will end up being. Okay, so other top news that we want to talk about is some port challenges. So I have been getting a couple of emails of some people asking about, you know, where to redirect your cargo and what ports to avoid. There's really four ports that if you're shipping to these ports, you need to really look at the routing as well as if you're exporting, you got to make sure you're looking at how the vessels are moving because that's also important. And, and we'll get back to the we'll get back to that uh, towards the end of the video. But you need to kind of plan better. But we have no planning strategies in this in this side of the world. So um, but anyways, so um, Houston, Port of Houston, um, it's getting really bad. Um, they're getting so much, there's so many containers. Um, they're actually going into say, uh, City Bay, I think it's called, City Bay, um, which is like a part of the port that the containers will go to. It's a yard, but nothing's electronic. It's all handwritten. Um, I have clients that call me consistently and, and trying to help them getting out of that uh, situation because there's a lot of truckers that don't want to go there. It's a waste of time. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little further down. Again, there's a lot to talk about. Um, so Port of Houston is a big one. So if you try, see if you could try to redivert your container, maybe going to a different port. Um, also New York, um, even though it's alleviating a little bit, they're having a huge chassis problem. So guys, you know, keep in mind, there is a big issue with equipment shortage and not just containers, but chassis or working chassis. Port of LAX, that's your shit show. Um, but there's a lot of exciting news, which I'll talk also about at the, uh, at the end of this, uh, of this post. So, and then the port of Savannah. Savannah's getting a little bit better, but guys, keep in mind, there's a lot of textiles that go in there. Um, capacity's crazy. Waiting to get into the ports are really hard. Um, so just even being able to return containers, um, they, there's just no place in, in the port to receive them. So um, it's, it's causing a bit of a mystery. So those are the four containers that I, uh, the four, ports that I would really look into if you're going into 
uh, be shipping into them. So, something to look at. Another one. All right, and now good old Maersk. <laughs> Man, a lot of people keep asking me, why am I so hard on Maersk? The reason why is because I've worked with Maersk, well, not directly, but I've worked, well, directly, but as a forwarder at one point in my life, as a trucking company at one point in my life, um, as a shipper, um, and as an agent. So I've worked with them, and, and their business model of, you know, trying to help the forwarder grow and helping them grow their services throughout the, the world has been really on the backs of the forwarders building these relationships. And Maersk has decided to kind of say, you know what? Now that we're making billions of dollars in profit, why don't we just do it ourselves and forget these guys? There's nothing they can do. We're making billions. You know what? We can take a couple of losses for the next 10 years and still be okay in the green. So just their process of what they're doing and, and the way they're doing it is destroying a lot of the market. And it's also causing a trend because you're starting to see other steamship lines saying, hey, you know, Maersk is, is really building up for this, for this one-stop shop. So a lot of these other steamship lines are going to follow. So I'm a little nervous of where it's going to go, but I'm seeing it more and more. And I've been telling you guys forever, ever. Um, I think my last two, three months ago when I said, hey, you're going to see steamship lines starting to buy forwarders. Um, and I made a joke about it. Um, and it's actually coming true um, to the point where there's even like CMA decided to buy the container terminal in LAX, the port terminal in LAX. I guess they, 10 ships, they already ordered ships, so hey, what else can we buy? Let's buy a container terminal in the United States. They need the money. It, it's mind-blowing. So it's, it's, it, it's crazy. But with that being said, as much as I dislike working with Maersk and at least don't like their business practices, I will have to give them thumbs up, props. Um, because they made so much money, and I've never heard of this. They decided to take $80 million of their profit and then share it throughout their system with their employees. I think that was excellent job, Merce. Great. Another way. You made so much money, you, there's nothing else to buy. You had to give the money away. Uh, holy cow. But hey, at least your employees got paid, which I think is awesome. Your people that work for you should be taken care of. So good job for that. But still at the end of the day, this is so funny. It's, uh, it's a joke. Um, it, it's crazy. Um, another thing about um, Merce that I wanted to discuss is there has been rumors that Merce was talking to C.H. Robinson. Um, and I believe C.H. Robinson were, walked away. That is dangerous, dangerous waters. We cannot allow, or we should really look at, allowing a full monopoly of supply chain, especially with Merce taking over a, a company or buying a company like C.H. Robinson, which I believe is the largest domestic company. I could be wrong, but it's, it's way up there. Um, the, the way they grew was the, especially was buying the network for American backhaulers. So I don't, I, I, I don't know, um, but we got to stop that. Um, and I'm glad that C.H. Robinson, from what I've heard, walked away because that, that would have really created a big problem in, in the domestic market because, you know, they're making millions on the container side and then they come into this domestic, start getting into the domestic side um, and lowering rates to where people can't live or compete, um, knowing that, you know, they're making all their money on the ocean where it's been the other way around. So I could see them doing that. So um, they, need, they, need, they need debits uh, for sure to offset some of these gains. So... Um, okay, so that's that's my whole thing with Merce. So, but good job, Merce, for giving that $80 million to your employees. That was a good move. All right, for the next one, some pretty spicy, spicy news. So I've been watching on LinkedIn, and I've been getting some emails from some people in these organizations. So there are um, there's these two companies. One's called Cargo Sprint, and one's called Pay Cargo. Now, these companies advance payment for you at the ports, at the airlines, to actually pull your cargo out of um, a warehouse. Let's say you don't have credit with them and you need to get it out. They have a relationship. You go through them, they charge you a fee, you pay it. Good, 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 good business model. But what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing on the internet and what I've read, um, they consistently um, are getting this, supposedly this cargo sprint is getting bullied by this pay cargo um, and they keep suing them. And what's happening is they keep losing these lawsuits and they're 
cargo sprint's starting to get really annoyed. So um, now keep in mind, these are your two biggest ones that do these payments. So there's, there's a lot of issues. Um, but if you're working with either company, do your research, um, look, into the, look into the management, look into the business owners. I did that myself and I think you should all take a look. Um, but really look and look at the individuals that run um, and that are a part of this organization. And maybe you'll see some pretty interesting things, like maybe they're in multiple companies. Uh, I mean, it's just interesting. But really look into the ownership because I think that you will be able to uncover an onion that's going to burn. Um, but I will tell you, it's, it's the one thing I really don't like are bullies. And um, speaking to some guys over at Cargo Sprint and their approach, uh, the approach of pay cargo to them, it's, it's, it's rare. It, it's, it's disappointing that we have to do that. So, um, but cargo, you know, Sprint Cargo, go for it, man. You guys are doing a great job. You know, I think that what you're doing is great. You know, I've spoken to a lot of people at Pay Cargo. I actually went through an interview process a while back and, and I was shocked um, just, just to see some of the responses. But now that I see this and read these, these lawsuits, um, it makes a lot of sense and so glad it was, uh, did not decide to go that route. So um, if you're working with either one of them, do your research, especially when it comes to payment and money. Okay, next topic. Some other exciting news too is BDP. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, BDP has been acquired. It's been bought. So the story with BDP is actually a very interesting story because I've worked with BDP in the past for many, many years, worked with them on many, many projects. And the one thing that uh, blew my mind was is that I was, I have still friends there and I was telling them, hey, listen, you know, they were bought out by this uh, private equity company called Greenbrier. Greenbrier owns like Seco and I think Uber Freight. You should look them up. They're, they're starting to really get into the industry. And I would speak to my buddy over there and I would say, hey, listen, just so you know, um, just by reading the portfolio, you guys make no sense. You seem like a flip. Um, and he goes, oh, they're going to hold us for five years. It's going to be great. Ten years. They were sold in three for a flip. And they were sold to, um, what was it? Uh, PSA. Okay, so the Singapore Port, Singapore Authority, PSA. Uh, I'll post a link below, and I posted it also on another link. But I will tell you, so let me tell you about a little bit about BDP. So BDP is known to move chemicals. They're big, they're really known for like moving Dow and DuPont, and um, they're very large into that, I guess, that vertical. Um, and they've, it's kind of a niche. So anything out of that was, was not really, they weren't really good at. But... That niche yields, in our industry, hazardous, yields a very, very high profit margin. So obviously it's just with the way the market's going and what clients are paying, perfect time as I kept saying in the beginning, bye, 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 um, and sell, sell, sell for the smart people. But they ended up selling to this PSA. So um, I don't know what's gonna happen. BDP's a freight forwarder. Um, this one's more of a terminal handling agent or you know, I guess they want to get the BDP network, which I'm trying to figure out. I'm thinking that's more of an acquisition of just their IP, their, 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 their deals with DuPont. But I, I just don't see the, I don't know, maybe they just had to spend money too. I, but I don't see what the gain in that one was. But, um, and the reason I brought that up was because, and it was so important because I was under the impression from what many people have told me that Maersk, not only were they talking to C.H. Robinson, but they've been talking about buying BDP. That they were on the radar to buy BDP. So I don't know what happened. I guess some of these companies are saying, man, Maersk, I'm sorry, you know. It's, I don't know, maybe that's why they had $80 million and decided to just give it away to their employees because they just, nobody else wanted to get, be bought by them. So I guess that's, that's what it is, man. So congratulations, Greenbrier, for crushing on that sale of BDP. BDP, congratulations for your new world in the ocean. Um, it's going to be a very interesting one. So good luck with that one. All right. So I've been watching nonstop on LinkedIn and other social media outlets, um, you know, where we like to gossip. Um, is this, this, this one particular gentleman, um, and, and I had to research him myself, and I, and I got a lot of information, so thank you everyone for sending it to me. But I wanted to just kind of discuss this, because maybe you guys can bring this to light for me. So I was watching LinkedIn, and I saw an article, and I saw an interview, um, and this interview was incredibly interesting. Now, this is supposedly the CEO of a very large company, 
it's mind blowing. Um, I don't know if this was just, he maybe had a lot of rich friends um, because his knowledge of the industry is crapola. Uh, great sales, great sales. I love the, the charisma, but full of shit. Wow. But hey, it reminded me of this. Now my mom always told me that miracles happen every day. Some people don't think so, but they do. Right now, when and a trucker want one of the problems is at the gate of these port terminals. If a trucker wants to go pick up a container, they have to bring a specific container number, and then it, that container has to be dug up from the bottom of the pile and brought to the front to give to that truck driver. If we adopt technology, this is easy. The technology already exists. Flexport has built this technology. Allow you uh, the truck driver just to come and we'll give the truck driver a container, and the mobile app will tell the truck driver where to take it. And if the recipient's not ready, we need a, a yard off site so we can clear out this terminal and clear the backlog. <laughs> Unbelievable. So here is an interview that I need you guys to watch. Um, there's only parts and clips, but this is the one thing that really blew me away, especially because the issue that we're having at the ports, it could be, there could be an easy way to solve it. Uh, I shouldn't say easy. It, it'll take a lot of work, but the solution, if you really want to take the congestions out of these ports, especially LA, is maybe getting more trucks and maybe supplying more chassis. There are no chassis. I go against the port of LA every day, every day. So if you're trying to get equipment and chassis or trying to get your, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna happen. So, um, but when watching this interview, I almost lost it. Um, so there's one part, and I'll play that here shortly. There's one part that was insane where he would expect a trucker to have on his phone app the container number and location for him to go pick up that box, right? Um, but it's always under something so they can't go in, um, just so they know they could flip him very easily as long as you know, that, that would work. But here's the other challenge that you're gonna have. Not only do you have a problem with not enough truckers, but you have something called the ILA, okay? And I've talked about the ILA before, so I'm hoping that some of you remember, but the ILA is the International Longshoremen Association. So have you ever heard the expression, um, that 900 pound gorilla on your back? Right. So the ILA is more like a million pound gorilla on your back and you're not gonna mess with them. It's like messing with the mafia. So um, you could say anything you'd like and try to convince you know, clients to you know, propel your company with, with not facts, which is just your opinion, like mine are opinions, but you, 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 you gotta be more realistic. Um, and and this, is, this, is, this whole interview was a, a complete joke. Um, I think that these networks are just interviewing the wrong people. These CEOs, I mean, I, I don't know why they keep asking them. You want to know what's really going on in today's world in logistics? Interview a trucker. Go to a port and talk to a guy waiting in line that takes them three to four hours in line to get into the port, okay? And then have to go wait to get loaded and pull out. It could take five hours. Okay, so if you think that you're just gonna use your smartphone to just go in with a container number, that's not the way it works because the ports are ran from a completely different organization than the steamship lines. So it's just two different worlds. Those worlds are not gonna talk. The only way they're gonna talk is if they get the ILA on board and they're the ones that run those ports. So I, I, I think you're wrong. Um, I think that we, we need to get in there. We need to try to work on ways to get more people behind the wheel Maybe these steamship lines should be investing in chassis. There is not one steamship line wanting to help. They like building boxes, but they won't invest in chassis. It's ridiculous. Guys, this is the problem. You know, it's, we know it's broken. I could guarantee you, if you put more truckers and more chassis in the port of LA, you can pull them out, okay? And yes, there is a shortage of warehouses, so you're having issues. But what a lot of people are doing, they're transloading it. They're pulling it out of the port. I have a ton of customers that are pulling it out of the port, transloading in the warehouse and shipping them out. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, rates are high, 
uh, very high in LA, but you got to do what you got to do to get that congestion done. So again, um, we're, we're the ones causing it. Um, you know, we need more truckers. We, we need to stop this fantasy of coloring books and, and you know, stories about, a, a, you know, un, undoing a, a vessel that gets stranded with a little with a little shovel. I mean, this is let, let's be honest. You know, let's not lie anymore and let's say what's true. Um, technology is the next move in logistics. Um, there's a lot of technology in there and I've seen the interview and I've seen the technology. All the technology is the same. The technology that's really needed in our industry is the one with the steamship lines where you can actually get real-time tracking on your containers, which they're starting to come out little by little. But once they get that puzzle in, these carriers are going to be the, they're going to be the mega guys. So just be prepared. What's going to happen in our industry? I don't know, but I will tell you one thing. Saving Private Ryan is not going to help. What we need help is facts and we need help now. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you like uh, today's post and, you know, like on the bottom, leave comments, send me. I will try to post, you know, a little bit more frequently, but I'm incredibly busy. The market's going crazy. Again, like I said, it's a complete disaster and I need to see what's going on. Um, but again, thank you so much for your support. Any other thing, let me know. Thank you and be well.